All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, last day, last morning session. Woo! -hoo. Woo! I was going to say right after right after a wild LinkedIn party. So how's everybody feeling? Just got some nasty looks. So uh, <laughs> if anyone can relate, that would be me. My name is Caroline Thornton. I am a relationship manager at LinkedIn. I work with small to mid-sized businesses in the central region. And this morning we're in for a treat because we're going to hear from some of our small to mid-sized business leaders that have really been able to help transform not only the way their organization has operated, but also transform their career. So they've agreed to share some of their best practices and best kept secrets with you all this morning. So let me kind of go through how this will work. I'll have the panel introduce themselves and tell a little bit about their background and their story. And then from there, I'm going to try to channel my inner Oprah and uh, ask all the right questions in hopes that you can take something home uh, for your own transformation. Uh, I will throw out the disclaimer, no one's taking home a car. Sorry, not that type of Oprah. <laughs> there will be no, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car. But uh, what I'm hoping is that towards the end of this morning, you get a higher, you get a higher, you get a higher. Cool? Um, all right, so at the end, we will open up for questions. So write down your questions. We want to hear from you. Come on up to the mic at the end. And um, with that being said, not going to ask you guys to cheer, not going to ask you to, to applaud. It's way too early for that. Instead, can I just get a quick show of thumbs? Uh, does this sound like a good way to start the morning? Put them up. Hi. Perfect. I've been to a lot of sessions, and um, everyone keeps talking about the power of social media, and I just wanted to show my followers how many thumbs I got this morning, so thank you. Uh, and phones. Yep, and if you guys could just silent your phones and um, be on your best behavior, we're recording. <laughs> so we'd appreciate that. So with that being said, I want to do a quick intro, and if you guys don't mind telling your stories, we've got Lisa Bowen, we've got Mark Metters, we've got Mike McElhern, and we've got Steve Shapiro. So if you don't mind... Tell us a little bit about your story and how LinkedIn has played a part. Perfect. My name's Lisa Bowen, and I am the Senior Director of Talent Acquisition with Focus Brands. We are the um, operator and franchisor of some brands that you may have heard of, Auntie Anne's, Carvel, Cinnabon, uh, McAllister's Deli's, Most Southwest Grill, and Schlotsky's. We have over 4,500 locations in 63 countries and about 3,500 employees. I came to Focus Brands last November to build the talent acquisition function and team from the ground up. And we, started, we had started to use LinkedIn about three or four months before that. And we've really been able to add to our team and we're continuing to grow. So I currently have um, myself and a senior recruiter and a restaurant management recruiter. We will be responsible for international and domestic hiring for all of our corporate support positions as well as our field restaurant management positions in our company and stores. Okay, thank you. Cool. Right. Hi, I'm Mark Metters. I'm with Dolphin, and we are a 100% employee-owned company. We focus in the area of SAP solutions, and that means software and services and support and processes and, most importantly, people. We provide business, business performance improvement in those areas of SAP and only in SAP. And interestingly enough, for a fairly small company of 70 people now, we provide service to one third of the Fortune 100, which is, I think, kind of cool. We've doubled in size in the last two and a half years, which is, it's only 35 people, come on folks, it's not, that, it's not that huge a number. But when you're at 35 and you double the 70, it's a significant impact to your organization, to your structure, and to your foundations. And my role at Dolphin is a little strange. I'm about one quarter, maybe 20% recruiter, Talent Act, but I also run the largest business consulting area at Dolphin. I also do the organizational development and training I also help out in the IT world, in the HR world, and uh, I'm also the janitor, so that <laughs> really helps. Mike? Uh, my name is Mike McElhern. Uh, as you can see um, from the PowerPoint slide, uh, marketing presence in our organization is not that big, so I had to put my slide together. Um, <laughs> but what I will tell you is, um, so my title is uh, Vice President of Talent Acquisition. Uh, it's a fancy title for what I do. Uh, I'm, I'm actually a recruiter. Uh, that's how I started out in the organization. Uh, just a show of hands, 
Uh, how many folks in, in this room are either the only recruiter or at one point were the only recruiter at their organization? Excellent. Th this is the group that I want to talk to because you guys know exactly, you know, uh, you feel my pain and you, you, you can, you know, really strive to push your organizations. But my, uh, our company is about 720, a little over 720 employees right now. When I started with the organization, we were just under 300. So in, in my first year uh, partnering actually with LinkedIn, I made just under 200 placements by myself. So uh, I could not have done it without LinkedIn um, and, and their guidance along the way. Uh, so I represent uh, both sales and operations. Uh, we have uh, 74 locations across the country. See? Good morning, everyone. So in full disclosure, in the interest of full disclosure, I am not the chief financial officer at Baskey anymore. I am in transition. We recently sold the company. That's a good thing. And um, I'm looking for my next adventure. But I was at Paskey for eight and a half years. I joined there in 2005 as the chief financial officer, and I was also senior vice president of operations at that time. And when I joined Paskey, um, you know, Paskey still is a software company. Many of you probably use that software. If you booked your hotel reservation through the registration site, you use Paskey. That's what we do, group reservations for, for hotels and convention bureaus. So, but despite having a large company presence, lots of international customers, lots of um, events and reservations handled, we're a very small company. I joined, we were 40 people. I left, we were 72. So not, not a very large infrastructure. And, and when I got there um, eight and a half years ago, Paskey had a lot of issues in their personnel area, a lot of high turnover. Um, the recruiting strategy was primarily using um, for hire recruiters and headhunters. And I tackled some of the other problems, that, the turnover problems first, but then we went on to recruiting and I purchased one recruiter license and four job seats, and that's what we had throughout the whole time that I was there. We do not have an HR function, so I was responsible for working with the hiring managers on the job descriptions, um, posting the, the information on LinkedIn, sending out emails to the candidates that we searched, responding to those candidates, and shipping them over to the hiring manager. So we, we did not utilize anybody other than really me on recruiter and the hiring managers. And the strategy proved to be um, a, a really good strategy. We found better candidates through passive than we ever did through active. Um, you know, we, we shortened the cycle it took us to, to get people and we saved a lot of money. Initially, I allowed managers to use headhunters in conjunction with recruiter, but eventually they weren't allowed to do so. So the only way that we sourced our candidates was either the word of mouth through our employees or by using Recruiter. Awesome, thank you. So one thing that we'll hope that you'll take from today, it's not just the, the big guys out there that can benefit from LinkedIn, so thank you for that. Um, one of the themes of today is transformation, and we understand transformation takes a while. So we'd love to hear from you on what kind of challenges did you face before LinkedIn you know, came about at your organization? Mark, you wanna lead us off? Certainly. Last. Last year at uh, Talent Connect, we, my part-time recruiter and myself came out and we were talking to folks and they asked us, well, what ATS are you using? And we answered, well, we don't use an ATS. And the looks were, they were looks of horror, which I guess was apropos for Halloween. But it was not apropos for, we were, oh my gosh, what do we do? So we, we started looking at a, an ATS solution and because of some infrastructure changes internally, moving away from one platform and going to another, we didn't have the time in the last year to implement an ATS. So we used the tools we had, and we used LinkedIn. And it has been very successful. You've heard the growth. It, the, the other thing is that the tools that are out there now, the new recruiter, is I, I, we're actually now looking at not buying an ATS. We're just going to use uh, the recruiter. And then there was a, another thing that you mentioned job boards earlier, and uh, that was another challenge that we had. Seven years ago, we pretty much stopped using boards and we went to internal referrals. And the internal referrals actually pay off very nicely for our employees. They get a $5,000 bonus for bringing somebody in. 
That's not chump change. But I guess we were paying them too much because we weren't getting that many referrals until we, until we bought that first recruiter seat. Three referrals that same week. It's like, oh my gosh, what have we done? <laughs> but, it was, but it turned out to be just about perfect because our, our referral, internal referral versus LinkedIn uh, ascension numbers were about 50-50. And everyone that we got as an internal referral also, we used LinkedIn to, to, to review them and look at them and uh, are now using it as a workflow even for the internal referrals. So those are those were some challenges that we had. And by the way, we did have one, uh, we used a, a board one time, it was a consolidation type of company, and they gave us hundreds of leads. One was qualified, and that one, when we called them, said, oh, I, am, I really don't want to travel for a job that was going to be a 75% travel job. Oh, my word. <laughs> so, a couple of experiences. Okay. Thank you. How about Lisa, some of the challenges you face? Um, when I first came to Focus Brands, we relied very heavily on recruiting agencies. That's how almost all of our hires were done. Um, it's very costly, uh, but it's very comfortable for the hiring managers because they can actually reach out to people that they consider partners and they were used to it. So implementing change is always uh, challenging, I think. So getting buy-in from the leadership on changing some of the practices was a huge challenge in the beginning. So um, because I'm a little bit audacious, um, you may not see that up here. Those of you who know me know that that's true. Um, I figured that if I could show ROI in a way that was compelling to our leadership by focusing on the budget and the recruiting budget, then perhaps I could get some buy-in to the changes that I wanted to make with regards to agencies. So I put a goal, we, we kind of created a simple formula of how much we would give credit for each hire. And I said, we will save a million dollars this year. One million dollars. <laughs> In agency fees by doing this the way that I want to do it using LinkedIn. And um, of course, anybody who says, yeah, we'll save a million dollars, let's do that. So uh, we actually passed the $1 million mark in July and have currently up to this point, we've hired right at about 105 people for, and I'm not talking about restaurant management, this is more in our corporate offices and our corporate positions internationally and domestically, about 105 people and uh, have saved about $1.3 million. So I do not think that when I go in to, to, to pitch my budget for next year, I'm gonna get a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of pushback on buying LinkedIn. So we've done, uh, LinkedIn is our primary recruiting tool, and um, we have hired a lot of people with LinkedIn this year. Great. Speaking of ROI, I have the pleasure of working with Mike McLearn. Um, I'm his relationship manager, and he's got a really interesting way to calculate ROI. If you don't mind sharing the story, that'd be great. So, um, you know, in talking about budget, it's, you know, this is a, a great room to speak to it because you know, we have to defend everything that we do, you know, because we're, you know, in, in my organization at Waterstone Mortgage, they didn't even have a talent acquisition department when I started. So, you know, a lot of people when I walked in was, you know, what's talent acquisition? What do they do? Um, so what I had to do was defend literally everything, all my actions in, in the organization. Um, you know, it's funny when I hear other organizations like, you know, Google and some of the other ones, Stryker, talk about source of hire. Um, you know, where are their hires coming from? Where the, well, I can tell you where our hires are coming from. You know, myself and my group passively recruiting candidates. So what I try to do is this, is, is when I make a presentation about the resources that we're gonna need, I take a look at all of our core positions in our organization um, that we filled. So last year it was uh, 47 positions that we filled that had a major impact on the business. So had we not filled those positions, in the mortgage industry, a recruiter can justify a fee between 15 to 20%. So I take the lower, so I, I times the average salary of all of those candidates that we placed by 15%. And it gives you a number, that's what we would have paid in fees. The other thing that I think is even more important than that, not every business has the opportunity to do this, but we do. The, the thing that brings revenue into our organization is hiring sales folks, so loan officers. 
So please do not look at yourself as an expense, but also look at how could I bring revenue into the organization. So what I do is every loan officer that we bring into the company, uh, not only do we notate, hey, we, we brought this individual into Waterstone Mortgage, but I track their activity month by month to show, hey, this individual brought X amount of dollars into the organization. So, you know, I've been to a lot of talks this week on data and metrics, and for me, the most important data and metrics that I use are, are validation for my department and my role. That's great. And Steve, how about you? When, when finding the budget, all, what's yeah. the story? I'll tell you, it's a lot easier when you're the chief financial officer. <laughs> <laughs> um, approving budgets was never an issue. Um, and it also helped that our business model was one where our customers paid up front before they used our product, very similar to what happens when you buy a recruiter license. But um, it really wasn't that hard to sell. So if you go through the economics, and this is the way that we looked at it, you know, I, as I mentioned, we had one recruiter license and four seats. Well, that, that about equates to the fee that I was paying a headhunter for a mid-level uh, engineer, something like that. So, you know, even in a small company like ours where we may have hired 15 people in a big year, it's really easy to, to prove the ROI because after the first one, everything else was a win. And we, we certainly used it. In certain areas, it was really easy. In our customer service area, it was really easy to hire through... Um, through using Recruiter. Um, one of the things to keep in mind at a small business, and I hear this a lot, is that the fees that are paid to the headhunter fees, they justify them by saying, oh, I had a vacancy for a month. The money that I saved during that period um, you know, paid for that fee. And sometimes that's people who left, and other it's a new position that you plan to hire by X date, and you took an extra month, so you saved money out of your budget. It's a really bad strategy, um, especially if it takes you a long time to bring uh, somebody in to fill that seat. So, you know, with Recruiter, I, I really believe that we were, we sourced our candidates faster, we saved money in the long run, and ultimately I believe that we got better candidates than we had otherwise gotten. So it was a win all around. Great. We had a lot of hands go up to say that they're either the only recruiter or once upon a time they were. So would love to give some quick wins just right out the bat so that they can go home and, and put that into play. So Lisa, could you give us a quick win? Well, we had a few. Um, when we essentially eliminated agencies, and we do still use them for certain positions, IT positions and a few other things, um, we were able to hire so far this year, um, at very high levels, utilizing LinkedIn. So directors, VPs, and even a C-level uh, person, we were able to source and hire from LinkedIn. And I don't have to tell you what the agency fee on that would look like. So that helped my little $1.3 million. Um, so, and one of the things that was very interesting, and I know I talked with Alexis, my relationship manager, about international recruiting, because we do have an international presence. And I thought, how is LinkedIn going to work on international recruiting? And I will tell you that if you, through job postings and through in-mails and direct sourcing, we've essentially uh, moved our entire international recruiting function in-house and have not used an agency to fill an international position this year. So I was really skeptical. I was uncertain, and we talked about it. Uh, because there's not a translation tool, and I was just worried about it, but I will tell you that we got fantastic candidates in our international roles um, utilizing LinkedIn. So that was a great quick win, able to eliminate some of those extremely costly international agencies because they charge even more than the ones domestically. So the other quick win I think that we've had that's worked really well for us and hopefully this is something that can be a takeaway for you that you'll be able to use tomorrow. Um, I think that how we've utilized and how my team utilizes InMail is critically important to the success we've had with LinkedIn. And I've worked in some very big companies that have dozens and dozens of recruiter seats and people sending out dozens and dozens of InMails. And I've been the recipient of some, some InMails that were really not very well done. Um, grammatical errors, spelling errors, typos, wrong names, wrong job positions, all kinds of stuff. And I think that one of the things that you can do when you go home is look at your, your team and look at your own in-mails and make sure that you're not doing blanket in-mails. I don't think they resonate very well with people. 
And one of the things that we've done is we've been very deliberate in how we send emails and who we send them to and what our ask is. So I've created a lot of templates. We utilize templates in a big way. I probably have 20 of them for different things, asking for different things at different levels. People who are our followers who already know about our company have a different template than somebody that we have to explain what we do. So there's a whole way to utilize InMail. And I would, I would take a look at what your, what your folks are sending out and just make sure that you feel really good about it, and also who you're sending to. So some of the things that I do when I'm sourcing for a director, for example, I go one level up and I only ask for referrals. Can you please send me a referral? You're a vice president, chances are as a vice president, you've mentored a bunch of people along in your career, and you would love to see them be, know about this great opportunity, right? And I've gotten an enormous amount of, of um, referrals from that. And as a matter of fact, the person that we ultimately ended up hiring as our CIO, I first heard about from a referral that I asked for on LinkedIn. So when I go to get referrals, I go one level up. But even when I go to direct source a candidate, and I think we all do the thing where we say, do you know anybody who might be interested in this job? What I do is rather than sending out a career opportunity template, I send out an expertise request template. So I don't actually send it out as though I'm asking them for the job. I'm actually saying, is there anybody in your network that you might think would be interested in my role based on your impressive profile? It seems like you might know some folks and I'm asking for your expertise. And I will tell you that the trend on that is almost every in-mail that I get back when I get those, and I have about a 40% acceptance rate on my in-mails, is why didn't you ask if I was interested in the job? Right? And so, in a way, it was accidental, but it's turned out to be a little bit of a psychological <laughs> trick to say, I'm asking for your expertise. And I do that because I'm more likely to respond to an expertise request than I am a career opportunity. So, when you make somebody feel good, then they say, Well, I want to come work for you. I like you. Um, so, those are a couple of quick wins that we've had, but that's a takeaway. Go back and look at how you utilize InMail um, because there is a lot you can do with it. It's funny, we had, a, we had a prep call and when she shared that best practice, everyone kind of got quiet on the line because some of the other panelists were taking notes. And Mark, would you, would you yeah. explain? I, I literally sent out a, a note that day when, after our prep call and said, do you know anyone that might be interested in this job? And the person came back within, it was a couple of hours and said, hey, what about me? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Playing the ego like, card. So oh, right. yeah. <laughs> it was <laughs> like, wow. Yeah. So it does work, we've already tried it. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. Steve, I think you had another one that you wanted to share. Sure, so we, as I said, we were a small company, so we were able to hold full company meetings where we had everyone in the same room. And a few years ago, I explained exactly how the recruiter tool worked and how we were handling recruiters and you know that we were no longer gonna be using the outside um, headhunters or search firms. And I encouraged everyone to update their LinkedIn profiles. And you know, I explained to them how important their um, portrayal of the com company was important, so the employment branding. I expressed to them you know, the need for photos, for complete job descriptions, for no grammatical errors. And I actually offered, and some people took me up on this, to help them get their profiles up to date. And I think when they realized that um, we encouraged the use of social media, and that it was an important part of the, the whole employment brand. Um, the elevate, their, you know, their interest was elevated, their engagement was, was much better. We also did um, have small um, referral fees from our employees that we had very few people take advantage of. And you know, I, I expressed to them, if, if the referral comes in through LinkedIn because of something that you did, you know, whether you spread the word that we were looking for positions or someone you know saw your profile, more than happy to cut that check. It's one of the, you know, it's an easy, it's an easy check to cut, and it, and it absolutely increased the engagement level and the number of referrals that we had. So. Yeah, I, we did something very similar to that, Steve. We we actually said, hey, let's let's everyone get your LinkedIn profiles up to date. One of the consultants got theirs up to date, and immediately a former employee or a former colleague of theirs contacted them and said, hey, we need some help with this. They had a two-hour conversation and it resulted in a $350,000 sale within a week. And it was because 
somebody just went in and updated their profile, and it, it, it just transferred on. And it wasn't, a, it wasn't about a talent acquisition. This was about a sale, which is, well, I think that's good stuff, right? Funny. Definitely good stuff. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it takes yeah. good stuff. Just checking. Yes, that's good stuff. Uh, another common theme that kept coming up on our phone calls as we were prepping for today was uh, follower base and how important that is and how difficult it can be to grow your follower base. But um, a few of you would, would be happy to share how, you know, how did you grow your follower base or, you know, what was some strategy behind that? Mark, you want to take that Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, good question. We've been able to increase our follower base by 5x in the last uh, about two years. And of that follower base, 70% were directors, managers, or executives, or C-levels, which is exactly what we're looking for in, our, in, in the follow base from a sales standpoint. And in fact, the reality is we tend to hire more mature consultants because they're dealing with the Fortune, Fortune 500s. Uh, how did we get to that? One is we sent out that template, Every time someone reaches out for a job interest, we come back and say, hey, why don't you follow us? And it's about a 50% follow rate. And these are people that are, may not, we may not hire them, but they may be hiring us as, as they are the customer and we're the provider. So it is a, it's a huge cycle, huge spiral in that regard. We also found that our, uh, our work, with, work With You campaign was very effective, or Work With Us campaign was very effective. Uh, a click-through rate of about 0.81%, which is 10x the, the standard. We, uh, we use a lot of the social media. We've got our, our senior executives talking about the company, the 100% the employee owned, the solutions that we provide. So our CEO, CTO, CFO, uh, and CMO are all on those videos, and we've got them spur spur interspersed around throughout not just the career site, but the, the, uh, the company page as well. Um, we also do an employee's why I work here blurb. So you get two of those on a career page, and every two to three weeks, we swap people out. So why do you like working here? And, and literally, I go out every couple of months and say, to the, especially the new people or the person that didn't ever respond to the first request, second request, third request, then I pick up the phone and call them and say, why do you, and then I jot it down. And we use those, and it is very effective. People see why, why they, they would like to come to work, why people like working at Dolphin. And that's so powerful. Lisa, I think you had some success with your follower base as well. We have. I, I, I believe um, that whatever avenue you have to get people to follow you is one of the most important things that you can utilize. And LinkedIn and any of your social media platforms, it is the, the foundation where all of the work is going to get done on top of it, and it will make your life so much easier. So go and get followers. But I'll tell you a little bit about how we did it and what results we had. When I said, my name's Lisa Bowen and I'm with Focus Brands, until you saw the coffee cups that said Cinnabon and Carvel and Moe's, you didn't know who I was. And I get that. So we're in a situation where we have a lot of very recognizable brands. And we even have highly charismatic, recognizable brand leaders, like Kat Cole, who's the president of Cinnabon, and Paul D'Amico, the president of Moe's, who have been on Undercover Boss but nobody really associates them necessarily with focus brands. So we did a few things, and I'm gonna give a little shout out to my, to my relationship manager, Alexis, right there in the red, we dressed all you like. Um, <laughs> she really did a lot because I said when I, took, when I took this position, the first thing that I said is I want to build my follower base because I think it's one of the most important things you can do. And she gave me some great strategies because we had a lot of brands with individual brand pages. And we were able to roll those up under the umbrella of our Focus Brands page as affiliated pages. So whenever you click on Focus Brands, all of my brands show up. And whenever you click on one of my brands, Focus Brands shows up. 
So it gives our candidates a really, first of all, it gives us a very, I think, much more cohesive employment brand, but it also gives our, our candidates an opportunity to learn more about each of our brands and about focus brands as a whole in kind of one tidy place. So we did that, and what we've done is we've increased our, I started working on this in February when I really got up and running, and we've increased our followers from about 3,200 to a little over 11,000, about 11,300 in about seven months. And the way we did that, and this is important, and this is something you can do every day when you go back to work, one or two times a week, find something compelling about your company to post. It doesn't matter. I, I use, if Moe's comes out with a new commercial because they do cool commercials, I'll post the commercial online. If Cat Cole does an interview on Good Morning America, I post it online. If somebody in Nation's Restaurant News writes about a charity event we're doing, I post it online. And then Alexis helps me get the analytics piece you have to look at because that's going to give you great data on what's resonating with the people who are following you and what's not. So it'll help you figure out better things to post. For us, if we're participating in a charity event or raising money for charity, those things get a, an enormous amount, tens of thousands thousands of impressions, and they get a lot of conversation. People will leave comments. Don't just let those comments hang out there. Talk back. These are people that are interested. They like what you're doing. They might have a question. So I think it's really important. So we get a lot of people that engage with us on our, on our LinkedIn page. So it's really, really neat. Um, as a data point, because I like data points, I'm a little <laughs> bit of a geek, um, one out of three people that we've hired so far this year from our LinkedIn have been followers before we started to recruit and hire them. We utilize uh, follower, our follower base in our searches. We go look there first, or at least in addition to, because those are people who already like you. They follow you, they want, or they're your competitor, and I'll take that too. <laughs> so, you know, we want people who are following us because they're a lot easier to recruit. So that's something you can go and work on, and, and it will be amazing how quickly your numbers will go up. And if you, if you roll all of our brands in, we've got almost 20,000 followers. So it's a great place to start when you're recruiting. That's great. Thank you. So obviously very important to engage with your followers, so thank you for sharing those tips. Um, something I'm excited to, uh, to have you listen to today is Mike's experience, because again, I work very closely with Mike, and one of the things that he was focused on is not only getting more followers, but being able to target the right people and then communicating with people that aren't already a follower. So Mike, if you don't mind, we'd love to hear your story. It's been really fun to watch your success. Um, yeah, so when we started out, we had just over 125 followers uh, for uh, Waterstone Mortgage, a division of Waterstone Bank, but just Waterstone Mortgage as is 125 followers. Uh, currently, we're just over 2,600, closing in on 2,700. So. I would encourage everybody in this room to follow Waterstone Mortgage. <laughs> so, but uh, so I, Caroline and I were talking, and I, I said that that's you know that's one of my struggles is how, you know how do you get people you know uh, we're not Cinnabon we're not you know uh, Mo's it, it, it just we're not that compelling you know or so I think um, but it's like how do we become that compelling you know how do I make mortgages compelling how do I get people to follow what we're doing. So uh, Caroline uh, presented a new product that LinkedIn rolled out called Sponsored Updates. How many people in the room are familiar with Sponsored Updates? Good. Good. Um, when I first heard about it, I initially thought, I'm like, oh, this, you know, this is more in marketing. You know, it, it, it falls more in the marketing realm than I think what I'm trying to do in talent acquisition. And then she came back, and we have a great relationship. So she, when, I, when she came back again, I'm like, all right, now I really got to look at this thing because she knows it's going to be good for our business because she knows our business inside and out. And so then when I finally looked at it and I, it, the light bulb went off, I said, I could use this to get more followers. I could use this tool to expand our reach to invite people to learn about Waterstone Mortgage and potentially follow us. So... What sponsored updates allows me to do is we have three recruiters and you know on a monthly basis we can only reach so many people. You know, if you go back to your office tomorrow or next week, you, know, you can only reach so many people via phone, via email, email, whatever uh, technology you want to use. But what 
uh, sponsored updates allows me to do, it allows me to select a category and hit that range of people on LinkedIn. So for example, if I wanted to hit every loan officer in the country, I propose my message, I select loan officers, click, send, boom. And the update is running until I shut it off. So what I've done is I've taken a group of three and I've made us almost like that striker group that I listened to yesterday where I saw a picture full of recruiters and team members and it, it makes us more powerful to talk about the numbers. Month over month, we're averaging almost 100,000 people that look at our message. You know, because when I originally started, you know, and I heard that, you know, how do you gain followers? All right, great, so I'm gonna post something and 125 so people are gonna see it. So what? You know, what's, you know, even now, 2,600 people are gonna see it. You know, it's not really like a 20,000, but last month, over 100,000 people saw my video of our CEO talking about why Waterstone Mortgage is a great place to work. That is, there's just value in that power of, I guess, uh, I think of, uh, you know, that movie Multiplicity, you know, where you, you turn three into six and six into, you know, and so forth. And, and it gives me the power to reach the entire country to get our message out there. Um, you know, month over month now, we're averaging just over 200 people are following our organization. So. It's an excellent product, or 2,000, yeah. 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 See, see how well I know them? <laughs> no, that's awesome, thank you, Mike. Um, so in order just to wrap up, before we do turn it back to uh, the audience for their questions, would love to hear just some last piece of advice for, for the people that might feel a little overwhelmed, might have to do this all on their own. What are some you know, just quick last words of advice that you'd share with the audience? Um, I think my, my words of advice would be around networking. Uh, I think networking needs to be a two-way street. I think that sometimes we approach networking in a, a rather self-centered way. Um, we want to ask for something all the time, and I think that we need to maybe look at it in an other-centered way. So I provide, you know, I have a, a huge network on LinkedIn. I don't know and have close relationships with the 5,000 people or however many it is, but I have about 300 people that I go and ask for a lot. So for those people, I watch a TED talk at my, my desk every day during lunch. And I'll, I'll think about my network while I'm watching and I'll say, you know what? Mark might really find this interesting. And I'll send a link and I'll say, you know, I was watching this today and just wanted to send it to you. I thought you might find it interesting. And I think when you do kind of, when you give first, when you ask, it, it feels better, and I, I, so I think that um, networking's a two-way street, and if you, if you add value to your network, you will get a lot of value back, kind of networking karma, or <laughs> whatever you want to call it, but that would be my piece of advice. I think that we, as recruiters, we're asking a lot, so I think we need to get back. Work with marketing. Mm -hmm. You have to help drive that brand Talent brand is our component, perhaps, but it's the overall brand that we're having to drive. Don't let yourself be shoved into a corner, because in the infamous words of uh, Patrick Swayze and Dirty Dancing, nobody puts baby in the corner. <laughs> but seriously, you have to, for some of you, the talent acquisition belongs to HR, and for some of you where it belongs in marketing, or for some of you where it stands alone, You've got to synergize and play with those other team teams and team members to, to make it really work. Uh, leverage your executive team, and it's not just for the, the dollars and the resources, but it's also for the moral support. Because people watch what the executives are doing and will follow their lead. And if your, your C-level doesn't get on LinkedIn, guess what, their team isn't going to either more than likely. And, and finally, work with your employees for leads, for ideas, and I mentioned before about why you work here, why do you love it here, use that. Dirty dancing. Hey, <laughs> I gotta talk that. Nicely played. Where nice do I go played. from there? I, <laughs> I told me he was gonna pull out something special, but I didn't know where you are going there. Um, so what I would tell you is, um, you know what I love about the individuals that are in this room is, is we're the grinders of our industry. 
We're the ones that, you know, when you know people told me, oh, you're you're not going to hire anybody in the mortgage industry using LinkedIn, you know, when you we're the ones that look the hiring manager in the eye and say, no, this is the person, this is the one that's going to make a difference in our organization, this is the one you need to hire, or we need to do this employment branding, we need to get our message out there. We are the ones that fight every day to make our organizations better. So I was at an event um, on Monday or Tuesday, yesterday. Wow, it feels like it's been here <laughs> 10 days. Um, and I, I, got a, I got probably one of the nicest compliments I could have gotten. I was, I was talking with a group that was, um, one, they're, they're in the mortgage industry. They're 25 times larger than we are. So initially I thought, crap, what are they doing at LinkedIn Talent <laughs> Connect? Because now my secret's out and the gap's closing, but I, I, I also looked at, oh, the mortgage industry's catching on, that's pretty cool. And uh, they told me, uh, I, I was speaking with them and they said, you know, I just, you know, I introduced myself to the company and they're like, we know who you are. And I, oh, well, I know who you are too, because they try to steal a lot of your employees. Uh, <laughs> But they said, they go, you know, we've been watching you on LinkedIn. We actually built our talent acquisition platform off of what you guys do. Cool. Wow. So what I'll tell you is this is, you know, we think we're in a silo, right? You know, in that little office, just pounding away, asking for more money, asking to hire this person, do that. But what I will tell you is if you keep grinding and you keep working, the results and where you're going to take your organizations are going to far su surpass your expectations. You're here. Steve? So my advice is stay on top of your hiring managers and get onto LinkedIn every day. I mean, at a small company, the recruiting function, especially you know, in, in our case where we were very small, is something that you're asking the employees to do on top of what is also very busy already. Um, that's true at, at every size company, but you know, we didn't have a, an HR function, we didn't have professional recruiters, so any of that was a burden for our people. And um, time is not your friend. I mean, if you ignore candidates that respond to your in-mails, it's, you know, it's never gonna be a good, good outcome. So you really, really need to stay on top of the people that you, you've brought into this process. And you know, at Passkey, as I mentioned earlier, some areas like our customer service area, that was really easy to do. Those people were more engaged. In engineering, um, so our development side where they sort of operate in triage mode all the time. So, you know, if, if they're working on an interview or they have an interview scheduled, but our system has some sort of problem, they don't want to hear about the interview. So you, you've got to stay on top of these managers all the time. And, you know, that's my advice is don't let the process slow down. Um, keep everybody fully engaged. Right. Great advice. Thank you. So now we will open up to the audience, and if you have a question, we'd love to hear from you. If you don't mind walking up to the mic so that we can pick it up on camera, that'd be great. Any questions out there? <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> well, all right then. I'll only ask two, and they're mostly for Lisa. So um, you mentioned your international presence with LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So I come from much larger companies. I work for a very small company now that had no HR two years ago, and now they've got myself and five people. Um, and I'm about to pitch on Monday a global LinkedIn relationship. So do you have a global relationship, or you just have a local that you are also sourcing international candidates for? OK. I might not have understood the question. We, we place people internationally. Is that what? Do you have other locations internationally? Yes. And do they also share your LinkedIn account? Do you think, have a? I think the well, question is, yeah. We have, two, we have two recruiters. I do the international recruiting. So but it's all based in one relationship here. It's all based mm -hmm. in one relationship with LinkedIn, yes. OK. I didn't know there was one. We, we did that same thing. We, we opened our London office. I worked with a manager there. No different than what we did here. We posted the jobs. Mm -hmm. I directed through the in-mails the candidates that came in back to the hiring manager in the London office, and then I let her run with it from there. So we did it all within the one recruiter license that we had here. Right. Yep. Well, I can come sit up on the panel and tell you all about the great benefits of global relationships with LinkedIn. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and cross your fingers that that become successful. I just wanted to know your experience. And then you mentioned regarding your followers and growing your follower base, you know, anytime you have something that's 
substantive or informational or engaging, you're putting it out there, you try once to twice per week. Who's doing that? I so when it, you're doing that yourself. And you mentioned that you have um, almost 20,000 followers, and I'm guessing each of those companies that you support has their own page, mm -hmm. right? So you're doing it on each of those pages? What we did, we have our marketing folks typically uh, do the branded pages. They post all of the stuff on their branded pages because it is a marketing function for the individual brands. For our Focus Brands page, I post all of the content, or my recruiter does. We, we both have LinkedIn seats. So we'll either post the, but mostly it's me because it's, it's my, you can it's kind of my thing. You can say baby. It's my baby, okay? <laughs> so, um, so for our Focus Brands, we have a, almost 11 and a half thousand, and the, the, the individual brands each have, I think most has three or 4,000, and Cinnabon has a couple thousand, so they have much smaller numbers, but um, I do all of the posting, and I respond um, to everybody that posts. One of the things I wanted to chime in there, because I hear that a lot, is it's not as time-consuming as you would think. It doesn't Especially, yeah, time. what Mike had said to me, like, oh, it sounds like marketing. I, I, you know, I said to him, I wouldn't steer you wrong. It's simple to do. Mm -hmm. Well, and the thing is, I'm on LinkedIn all day, every day. It, it's on my browser. It's on my computer all day. So if I'm sitting and I'm on hold, or if I, you know, am on a conference call that doesn't really involve me, but I need to, to listen, then I can go on. <laughs> Bust it. <laughs> Uh-oh. Stop tape. Stop tape. Um, but if... Um, You're not the only, only one. one. Shoot. One. It was I, think, I think your relationship manager is wagging her finger over there. Oops. <laughs> um, but anyway, so what I'll do is, and a lot of times I just go to the brand pages and see what they've posted. And I'll pull that stuff and put it into a folder so that I have a lot of data at my fingertips and I have a lot of things to post at my fingertips. Now, my next year's objective is that either myself or one of my recruiters is going to start to blog and then we'll start to post recruiting specific information and posts on our, our Focus Brands page so that it does become a little bit more candidate specific. Um, but that I haven't had time for yet. Um, I do blog, but it's about something that is a personal um, thing Just for me, to so. touch on that, okay. we, um, you know, I think one of the biggest things about the marketing and posting side of it is preparation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that, that I learned was create a content schedule. So, you know, if, if you said, you know, okay, I'm going to post something today, what's that going to be? You know, I don't know. You know but if I know, if I'm working, okay, I'm gonna post something the first week of November. Okay, so I have my quarter planned out. So, you know, we know what we're doing, you know, a couple months in advance. So that way, when, you know, October 1, November 1 comes, I know exactly what I'm posting. It's pre-thought of. But I think we're a lot of, a lot of small uh, organizations, mid-sized organizations, we wear a ton of hats. You know, we're the recruiter, we're the marketer, employment brand, you know, everything. Um, interviewing, hiring, you know, so when do I have time? But if you build it into your schedule and say, okay, you know, every first week of the month, I'm gonna have something up on our career page. I think you'll be a lot more successful. And I think too, it doesn't take that as much time as it might seem like it does. And sometimes I'll even just go to the, like all of our brands, I'm, I'm fortunate because I have all these cool brands, but they all have a YouTube page. So sometimes I'll go, oh man, I haven't posted anything this week, so I'm not nearly as deliberate <laughs> and well thought out. But I'll say, what strikes my fancy today? And I'll go kind of fish around or I'll look through my folder and say, you know what, these guys are doing something really cool with raising money for Alex's lemonade stand selling pretzels. Mm -hmm. And I think that's cool. And that seems to resonate well with the people that follow us. So I'll say, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna find one of those and I'm gonna put it up today. And literally it takes, five minutes. Mm -hmm. And so I think that um, I'm not nearly as deliberate and it, it is much more about what strikes my fancy on any given day um, as to what I might put out or what the brands are doing. Or I'll try to look and if you, if you look through my page, I try to show each brand a little bit of love because I have more followers. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think it really is just about making five minutes. I put everything on my Outlook calendar though so I do have a tendency to follow that. Well, I think the planning idea is a great one because mm -hmm. a lot of that work is already done, right? So if you partner right. with your marketing team, they already have their yep. promotional plan or their whatever it is that they plan to put out on social networking, and you can just yeah. steal that. So I like that idea. I, yeah. I stole that from LinkedIn. So the Chicago office, 
I was actually giving a presentation on social uh, marketing and I went down there and someone, uh, one of the individuals in the marketing team talked about their content calendar. So I was supposed to be the keynote speaker and I'm like, right, I'm like, that's genius. I'm gonna do this, <laughs> so I'm full that. disclosure. I, I, <laughs> I also, I wanted to give Mike a quick plug because uh, if this is something that interests you, he's actually gonna be hosting a free webinar on November 4th on this. So uh, the content that he shares and how he reaches outside that follower base. So if it's something you're interested in, November 4th, reach out to your relationship manager and they'll get you the invite. One last point, I sit with our marketing team at least, whenever they have a marketing meeting, I go in and sit and, and listen to what's going on and chime in my two cents until they tell me to be quiet. <laughs> but it, it, it does help because you need to coordinate because if, if the careers page or the, the recruiting stuff is going this direction mm -hmm. and the company branding message is going a different direction, it, show, it, it is very clear and very obvious and very evident to anybody who looks. So you do want to make sure that the message at least merges to some degree. And once you start posting, your marketing people will start sending you stuff. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. it may, keeps them from having to do it, right? right. So, and and they, want, they want to share. They, they want you to be successful. They want us to have more followers. They understand the importance of it. So I get a lot of links from our marketing folks. Hey, did you know that Kat did an interview this week? Or, yeah, didn't know it. Excellent. We'll put it up. So. Thank you. Thank You're you welcome. For Thank you for the questions. Would you mind? I'm sorry to make you get up. Yeah. Would you mind? Thank you. No problem. Um, my question is actually for Mike from Waterstone. Yeah. Is that right? Yep. Um, early on, you said that in your first year, you hired over 200 people. Yeah. Um, and as someone who I'm basically the HR department for the startup that I work at, I was employee number 22 back in January. And I've hired about a person a week, engineers, data scientists, all of those things. And I feel like that's pretty amazing. So when I hear 200, I wonder how do you, part of, I'm already working crazy hours because yeah. I'm also managing like the interview process. Are you also in charge of like scheduling every interview, doing all the debriefs to the hiring managers? Can you yeah. let me in your brain and tell yeah. me how you manage that? Because <laughs> I, I would love to I don't know, know if you want to get in there. <laughs> I, but I can give you the answer to the question. Okay. Uh, I'm a lot closer. You really don't. <laughs> uh, well, first, I, I'm a big golfer. Okay, so the reason why I share that is because, um, so I don't work a ton of hours either, especially in the summertime. Um, so I do have, you know, work-life balance. It's not a thing where I'm in I the don't. office 24-7. <laughs> um, but, you know, what I realized was one of the things that, you know, one of the big issues that I see with ATSs is, is that, you know, resumes would come in or information would come in. And, and initially, I was spending about 85% of my time sourcing 15 or 10% of the candidates that I wanted to talk to. And I realized it real quick. I said, I'm, I'm not going to get anywhere if I do it this way. So I flipped it. I said, I'm going to spend 85% of my time focusing on 15% of the candidates that I want to get. And what I did was I am very granular as far as exactly who I wanted to go after yeah. at Waterstone Mortgage. So when I was reaching out to candidates to present an opportunity, uh, there was, you know, it, it was very specific who I was going to go after. Um, so oftentimes, I would tell the hiring manager, and, I, it, and you might not have this relationship, but I would tell you, they listen if you do, uh, you know, stress upon them. I, I said, I'm going to, Max, I'm going to present three candidates to you. Max, three, that's it. After three, you're on your own because the three that I'm going to present to you are going to be the very best candidates that are in the marketplace. So when you stress something like that, I was very confident that I could go into recruiter, build the relationship, and present the candidates where, you know, hey, these individuals are going to be top quality for Waterstone Mortgage. So when you can, when you compress that down to, okay, you know, a lot of times we didn't even get to three. We got to one or two, but I would say this is the individual. This is the one we want. I know it. I know the market. I could give you demographics, and I would back it up with data. But when you compress the hiring time or the interviewing time, that allows you to get to 15, 17, 18 candidates a month and manage the process. Just a quick follow-up question. Um, I came from agency recruiting where I was in a niche. I recruited one kind of candidate for 10 years. And now I'm in a position where I feel like I really get my arms around a role just as I hire it. So how did you get to the confidence level that you could find 
the three best candidates in whichever area you were going to be recruiting? Yeah, that's a great question because a lot of the candidates that I was placing, you know, for example, our first year were like CIO, uh, Vice President of Finance, um, compli VP of Compliance, um, you know, so they're a VP of HR, so there are a lot of different components there. Uh, the first thing that I did was I made sure exactly that I knew where the company wanted to go. You know, I, I had a number of talks with the executive management group. I'm very close with the CEO, and I said, you know, if you could build an organization, what does it look like? You know, what's the culture? You know, what are the people like? What do you want to achieve? And and once I understood what that was, when I was interviewing a candidate, it made it a lot easier for me to understand, hey, this, this individual is going to be a great fit for Waterstone Mortgage, or no, this is not going to work. And one of the things that I impressed upon our organization is, and I said, you're going to have to trust me on this one, but I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a shocker. Not all the brightest individuals in the world are going to come from the mortgage industry. There's going to be individuals that we're going to need outside the mortgage industry that we could bring in and they could probably, that level of experience that they bring into the mortgage industry is gonna change our business. So that allowed me to broaden my scope instead of just going after folks that had mortgage experience to going after individuals that were qualified for the role and qualified for the culture that we were trying to keep. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I think we have time for one more. Hi, uh, so my question is for Mike. Um, so Caroline is also our relationship uh, manager and she's shared quite a bit about your success with sponsored op updates. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so we're in the process of actually purchasing sponsored updates yeah. and we're really interested in it. You mentioned uh, sponsoring the recruiting video. Can you talk a little bit more about the content that you sponsor yeah. for recruiting specific uh, targeting? So what the video was, now we're, uh, Unlike Lisa, um, I had uh, two videos to choose from, so <laughs> it was, it was, was kind of easy. <laughs> it was either this one or it was that one. So, but what it was, it was actually, uh, number one, it was our CEO. It was a two-minute video, just over two minutes, and it was our CEO talking about why he started the organization, why he started the company, why he's so passionate about the mortgage industry, and, and how that it has framed our company today. But then it also talked about um, our, some of our top sales leaders in our organization talking about the mortgage industry is extremely competitive, but they talk about why they chose to stay and choose to stay and build their careers with Waterstone Mortgage. And then to finish it off, we had operations people talking about how they support the sales folks and how it's, you know, we're all working together for one common goal and that's to get a client, you know, customer into a home. So when you put a message out there, uh, what I think we did really well at was conveying who we are as people and what our culture is. And I think that a lot of times, you know, it's tough because as a recruiter, I'm calling you, I have an opportunity. You're immediately on the, well, I'm happy where I'm at. You know, but if I could send a video to you and say, hey, this is who Waterstone Mortgage is. I'm gonna let you behind the curtain and see what we're all about. Immediately, you're like, oh, those, those guys are okay. Like, they're pretty cool people. So when I call, or when I send you an in-mail and you saw the video, it's, you know what? I, I'm okay where I'm at, but I'd still like to network with you because our industry changes a lot. Great, thank you. Thanks. Cool. All right, I think that's all the time we have for today. So thank you so much for coming. and. Thank you to the panelists as well. Thank you. Thank you.